your Wednesday evening with us here at Texas A&M's Office of Sustainability. Uh, you're here with us for, for Virtual Earth Month. Uh, before we get into tonight's uh, event, uh, we have a really interesting talk about uh, renewable energy and the ethics behind it. So I want to go over, uh, you know, just a few logistics. Uh, so first of all, just uh, I suggest you put your um, your view into side by side mode. It's in your toolbar under in the view options. Also, I have enabled a live transcript. You can also find that in the toolbar. You can turn that on or off, just depending on how you would like to watch today. Uh, we also ask that you please ask some questions in the chat. You know, the more questions you ask, the better the discussion is going to be. Um, and then I don't have to think of all of the questions, so that would really help me out as well. So uh, please, you know, ask us some questions in the chat. And just letting you know we're recording this. It's going to also be on YouTube. Um, so during the discussion, we, you know, we welcome you to turn on your camera. Um, but if you don't want to, you know, be seen, just want you to know we're going to be recording this and posting it on our YouTube and as well as our Facebook Live. Um, all right. And we know you're also probably here because you're interested in some prizes. Uh, so we're having code words. They're going to be available during this virtual event. Uh, just pay attention. Um, and each uh, code word you collect is going to be equal to one point. And that point is going to be, you can enter that um, into a random draw. And we have all these really great prizes. So the more points you get or the more code words you collect, the more chances you actually have to win. Um, also, the code word will be written on one of the PowerPoint slides. It will be spoken by one of the presenters. And it will also have some uh, options in the chat. So just pay attention there. Um, and then keep track of your code words. Send them all in just one email at the very end of the at the end of the fe uh, festivities uh, on the on Friday, and uh, they're due by April 30th. To send them to sustainability at tango.edu, and uh, just letting you know um, that you can earn up to seven points per live event that you attend. So the more uh, the more options uh, for points are actually available when you watch live. If you watch the recording, you can only get one point. So you definitely want to watch live, and you can even earn cash through Maroon Base. So this is separate through the School of Innovation. Um, you, they have different events you can attend. All the virtual Earth men's events are included and uh, you can get points and you can win up to $2,000. So you can also check that out. Just download the app um, and you can see all the complete rules and details there. If you want to see that in writing, um, let's just go to our webpage, sustainability.tamu.edu for more. And here, let's check out this prizes. You can win a Nintendo Switch. I mean, that's pretty sweet. Uh, you can get an Apple Watch. Uh, you could get uh, AirPods, you could get Yeti coolers, you could get a GoPro, um, and you could also get an awesome sustainability t-shirt, sustainability water bottles. And those are just from attending events. Those are just from earning it. Those aren't even part of the drawing. So everyone can get those just for participating. Um, so now that you know the lowdown and what we have uh, for the prizes and how Virtual Earth Month uh, goes, I'm going to pass it over to Yasmin and Nikki, and they're going to talk to us about renewable energy and the ethics behind it. So whenever you are ready, uh, you guys can take it away. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So howdy and welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is Niki Mostofi. I am a senior mechanical engineering major and my pronouns are she, her. And my name is Yasmin Safian. I am a junior public health major and my pronouns are also she, hers. And today we are going to get, uh, give a talk about the ethical implications of the renewable energy transition. So. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so we'll start off with why exactly we are considering ethics within the renewable energy transition. Then we'll talk about what exactly energy justice is and why that's relevant. Then we're gonna go into five categories of consideration, um, which include place identity, temporal issues, distribution of resources, technology, and sociopolitical aspects. Then we'll wrap it up with some po possible mitigation tactics regarding the transition and end with some resources and how you can help. So we'll get started. Okay, well, there's definitely a lot of excitement surrounding the topic of renewable energy and it's for good reason. But as we make the transition over to a renewable based energy grid, there are a few ethical considerations that we have to start thinking about. Um, energy is a major determinant of a community's quality of life that can be easily overlooked if you haven't spent much longer than a day without it. Uh, for example, energy access is linked to health outcomes, educational ability, and economic development in communities. 
And the way that these conditions are connected to each other is highly cyclical. Let's take a look at this diagram. Um, so within society, there are some communities that are at a disadvantage due to their marginalized status. If, for example, you are part of a marginalized community, that means that there is some feature about your community that makes everybody else, aka the status quo, perceive you as lower status. Um, so as a result of this perceived lower status, uh, you're going to have limited representation, especially in governing institutions. And without proper representation, the needs of you, your family and friends aren't going to be heard, leading to the idea that you don't have as many needs or like the, the status quo just doesn't perceive that you have these needs, hence lower perceived demand. As a result, resource allocation is skewed away from those who might desperately need them. And if the resource in particular is energy, this community becomes energy poor. And as I mentioned earlier, if you don't have consistent energy access, you are then vulnerable to poor health and living conditions. And then you see the cycle start all over again. All of that being said, this means that the main goal in discussing ethics in the renewable in the energy transition is to avoid establishing an energy system that leads to the same mechanisms of control that we're seeing in our current energy system. Uh, and we want to advance forward with renewables while acknowledging that how we procure our energy and where it's sourced is only part of the problem. So now that we've gotten a little bit of that context out of the way, we can move on to what energy justice actually is. Um, and energy justice is the idea that burdens and benefits should be fairly disseminated among all communities. This means access to a functioning energy system, recognizing energy as a basic necessity and seeing this moment in history as an opportunity to improve energy systems that we have right now. A good framework to refer to this uh, is the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs. And if you're not familiar with these, I think in like 2016, uh, the UN set 16 different markers to indicate our progress towards a sustainable society. Uh, SDG 7 considers clean energy as a right for everybody, and SDG 16 considers the establishment of justice and fair governance. So as a whole, we're looking to establish efficient energy systems that can address current and future disparities through affirmative and prohibitive justice. Um, affirmative justice is the idea that if basic goods can only be secured through energy services, then everybody is entitled to these energy services. And prohibitive justice is the idea that we need to make sure that new energy systems are designed and constructed so that they don't interfere with people's current ability to acquire basic needs. So now that we've discussed some of these basics, let's define what the five main categories of energy justice um, are. Right, so let's, for, lo, let's first look at place identity as our first category. So how do we consider places in the sco scope of renewable energy? So typically a place can be defined as a space invested with meaning, whether it's a city, community, or a home. Um, places are deeply rooted in narratives and historical contexts. So it's only natural to feel threatened as an inhabitant when um, there are threat threats being posed to where you live. So when we look at these future sites of RE developments, we must take into account the historical narratives and the importance of the location. Um, and when we talk about narratives, we talk about narratives matter in the sense that places hold values and changes to that place can alter that narrative. So for example, let's take the proposed offshore wind farm in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, the local Native American tribes um, had cited concerns about the Cape Wind Project's impact on sacred burial grounds submerged by those waters. And additionally, the project would also impact traditional sunrise ceremonies held along the coast because the offshore wind turbines would block that view. So if this project would have gone through, which it actually didn't, there were some problems with it um, besides this. 
Uh, centuries old traditions would have perished with its constru construction, resulting, insulting the identity of those who sought to preserve that history. So when we talk about placism, uh, we usually regard it as more of a special interest rather than an obligation, but it's only right to consider the concerns of others, especially regarding the places that they call home and have close, close ties with. And this placism or place identity um, can be on a spiritual, emotional, aesthetic, or economic level. And I know aesthetic sounds kind of silly, like why does aesthetics matter in the sense of place identity? But if you tie it in with other aspects, it can be very important to the people who call that place home. So say for example, there's a wind farm project in a city where the economy highly relies on tourism. So the wind turbines may disturb the natural beauty of that scenery and in extreme cases, deter tourists who travel to that place for the natural beauty um, from visiting in the future because they're seeking a place where they can relax among nature and that machinery may disrupt that view. So aesthetics can be important if you look at it in the right aspects. So next we'll consider the temporal dimension. So what exactly does this mean for our generation and future generations? So take a look at these graphs on the screen. The left one depicts the global average temperature alongside the presence of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And the right one depicts the CO2 presence in the atmosphere by year. So it's quite obvious that the amount of carbon dioxide present present is um, related to the uh, global average temperature. And it's often repeated in newscasts and in, um, uh, I guess, a lot of these uh, documentaries that talk about climate change, that if we pass surpass that two degree Fahrenheit threshold of global average temperature, temperature we will um, experience irreversible effects of climate change and there will be no going back or taking back those changes. So it's really important for us as a generation to slow down those effects as best as we can so we don't surpass that threshold. So that's essentially our goal as a generation. Um, and we usually tie in carbon dioxide presence to greenhouse gases. So what does fossil fuel consumption and CO2 consumption have to do with ethics? So first we have to consider energy systems as both an intergenerational and intragenerational issue. Intergenerational being uh, that it's related to both our generation right now and future generations and intergenerational is within the same generation. Um, but in the ethics aspect, we're mainly looking at how our actions as a generation now will affect future generations. So the use and product, production of energy in our current generation will have lasting impacts on future generations, especially when we look at our incessant fossil fuel consumption. So when we're considering fossil fuels, our current energy source, not only are we releasing an excessive amount of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which in turn contributes to climate change, um, and the increase of global average temperature, we will inherently impact uh, future generations and ecosystems. Um, but we're also revoking their access to energy sources um, because we are continuing to deplete those resources because they're not renewable. They don't replenish, um, fossil fuels don't replenish. So they won't have the same access to those uh, energy sources. So we're revoking some basic goods and ser services from that future generation, which is a human right. Um, so our current fossil fuel consumption, we give a thumbs down. We're not doing a good job. <laughs> and so as a generation, we have to think of solutions. Um, and a very popular solution is renewable energy um, because it not only changes the way we consume energy, but um, it also reduces the amount of carbon uh, dioxide and greenhouse gases that it releases um, in comparison to fossil fuels. And it can save future generations from catastrophic events caused by climate change. And they will also have that same access to energy because renewable energy, such as solar and wind, can be replenished. So there's no uh, concern about running out of that source. Um, of course, all technology has negative effects, so it's in our best interest to counteract these effects as best as we can so that future generations won't suffer as a result of our inattentiveness. So thumbs down for <laughs> fossil fuels and we give solar energy on these houses a cowboy hat and a heart. <laughs> um. So distribution of resources is probably one of the first items that comes to mind when you're thinking about 
ethics in renewable energy, and it's for good reason. It's vital to determine the factors that come into play when you are physically giving communities their fair share of benefits under a new system. Uh, economics in particular is a hot button topic. It is undeniable that the energy industry is lucrative, and this will likely be a fact no matter how this energy is derived. We are a Texas university. I'm sure y'all know I understand the influence um, oil and gas has on our economy. However, it can be argued that the current status of our economy could be a little bit more stable. And part of this is attributed to reliance on one singular resource. All of this compounds into conditions that might not be very good for the general public. Moving forward, we want to achieve affordable energy systems, which means that the price of energy is low, but is also stable and equitable and doesn't require lower income households to expend disproportionate shares of their income on energy. So let's think back to what Nikki was saying about place identity and how it might have an impact on how communities generate income through tourism. And when we think about this perspective as well, that means that one aspect to consider is jobs. When we are constructing our RE sites and maintaining these systems, there absolutely needs to be a focus on sourcing labor locally and emphasizing transferable worker skills from people that might be working in one resource industry and how are we going to transfer them over to renewable energy. Uh, we also want to look at our currently marginalized communities. In Canada, Economic Development Corporation entity, uh, Economic Development Corporations have enabled Indigenous communities to actually own separate for-profit business entities that allow them to operate RE projects, uh, giving space in our legal system to recognize entities such as these will give Indigenous communities and other marginalized communities a chance to hold economic power. Geographic distribution is also pretty vital. We are sourcing energy from land that is livable and likely being lived on right now. Therefore, there's a need to ensure that the resources derived from that land um, are easily accessible to those who depend on it to survive. Accumulation is a really fancy umbrella, oh, sorry. Accumulation by disposition is a really fancy umbrella term for uh, any process that a governing body might use to restrict the ways that a population can use a plot of land. And in essence, this is something that we need to avoid and hold governments accountable for participating in. And this sounds really cut and dry uh, and really obvious. However, there are a lot of ways that this can manifest. And um, for example, when contracts are formed with Indigenous people, we need to make sure that even though they're signing it, we need to ensure that it's because they are signing it because they want to, that their participation is completely voluntary and not because they see no other choice. It's either, I guess my name is on the paper or I lose my land forever. Um, another really cool piece of tech that's emerging are microgrids. These are a method of small scale systems that can efficiently provide energy to offsite locations, but they can also be constructed into larger grids. This is a way to mitigate widespread breakouts, uh, yeah, energy breakouts in the system and also empowering rural communities by reducing their reliance on a larger grid. So for our next category of consideration, which is technology, we're going to travel back about like one and a half months ago. So I hope these headlines look familiar. If not, you were probably not in Texas when this happened, but these headlines are directly from the snowpocalypse that happened in February that um, affected millions and millions of Texans alike. Um, it was really scary <laughs> being in Texas during that time. but. Um, 
in regards to the technology and how we get energy distributed within our state, um, Texas lawmakers repeatedly failed to pass measures to require operators of our state's main power grid, which we do have our own power grid, um, to ensure adequate reserves are available to shield against blackouts like the ones that happened during the snowstorm. And despite Governor Abbott insisting that frozen wind turbines and solar panels were the cause, this was never the case, and it was in fact our inadequately, inadequately winterized natural gas equipment and the lack of those reserves. So when we, when we look at the technological aspects of renewable energy, we are considering the ethical deficiencies of the technology itself. So looking at our current energy system, the uh, electrical grid and future energy systems, inequities typically stem from these four places, safety, reliability, security, and vulnerability. So our current energy system, the electric grid, was created to provide affordable energy and it achieved that for some time. But however, it does cause pollution, land degradation, health, health effects, and contributes to climate change, which impacts both safety and reliability. And due to its interconnected nature, an electrical grid failure, failure has the potential to impair economic and social functions in the events of power outages, which then calls into question the non-vulnerable electricity aspect. So when we're looking at future energy sources, such as renewable energy, we need to consider all of these categories together and make sure they all um, are secure when we do uh, put in that transition. So first, when we look at safety uh, for renewable energy, we're talking about the amount of emission reduction, uh, the amount of emissions that occur during uh, both manufacturing, installation, maintenance, and use. And it's it's a fact that for renewable energy, greenhouse gas emissions are only limited to manufacturing, installation, and maintenance because it does not uh, release any greenhouse gases when it's in use. So we know we can check that safety box. Uh, next is reliability, and uh, this is in terms of the efficiency of the technology. So, for example, researchers are currently developing new configurations and models for solar modules, which is typically known like to be solar panels, um, to use in both commercial and residential applications. Um, the configuration and use of new materials and enhancement strategy, strategies such as plasmatic enhancement will increase the efficiencies of those individual cells, which will then become modules, which then we think of as panels, which thereby increases the reliability of the technology of the solar modules and their ability to produce and provide electricity. So we can check our reliability. Next, we'll talk about vulnerability. And this kind of go back, goes back to distributed generation and microgrids, just like Yasmin mentioned. Um, when we talk about like the interconnected na uh, nature of the electrical, uh, electrical grid, um, we know that we saw it ourselves firsthand that it is vulnerable. So when we do implement the new technology, we have to ensure through maybe microgrids that um, we, can, we can be provided with non-vulnerable electricity. So we can check that box off. And lastly, uh, we'll talk about security, which is kind of goes hands in hand with vulnerability, because if a there is a grid failure, we can't rely on secure energy being provided in both the residential and commercial aspects. So it's kind of like a domino effect. If we have vulnerable electricity, it's not going to be secure when it's being distributed to the people. Um, but we know through practice that RE has uh, the potential to be secure and non-vulnerable when it's being supplied. Um, but just a reminder that there's still room for more research into how we can create um, a more efficient and reliable electricity. So we still have ways to go, but we know there is potential to um, an ethically sourced technology for renewable energy. And that's a code word. Reliability is the code word. So if you're keeping track of that, it's right there. All right, moving on. <laughs> Um, so one of the final pieces that we're looking at um, is creating the governing structures to lead these RE projects. And that's where sociopolitics comes in. Uh, we can't just come in from the middle of nowhere and tell these people that have lived on this land for generations what, did, what they are allowed to do with this land and when they can do it. And it's really important to put the processes of energy distribution and control within the capacity of the people who will consume it. Uh, this means no red tape, no fine lines, and full transparency. And this is, in essence, the definition of community energy, which is also very at the bottom. 
Um, and there are three big pieces that fall into this. One is assessing how we address negative response. The science and numbers can say what they say, but it's still our responsibility to approach the concept while treating communities with dignity and respect. Um, a term I've learned for this is cultural competence, which is not only understanding the different perspectives that other people may have, but approaching those differences with grace and dignity and acknowledging um, the moments where you might misspeak and correcting yourself respectfully when you do. Uh, this also means avoiding reductive language towards those who might have different opinions from you. Um, because people are speaking up for a reason and you need to have an actual proper response to them when they bring up their concerns. For instance, nimbyism, which is like a short term for not in my backyard. Uh, this is this is the concept that came up a lot in the Cape Cod projects that Niki was talking about earlier. Uh, yes, the idea of like, oh, I don't want it in my backyard. It seems a little ridiculous, but the concern is not unfounded because these communities are still speaking somewhat from a background of mistrust towards corporate powers who may not have previously served their needs. The second part to consider is mechanisms of inclusion. We need to remember that representation is much more than a buzzword and we need to see it in action. This means making sure that marginalized communities are on decision-making boards and that they're overrepresented to ensure that their voices are heard because decisions need to be fully informed by those who are impacted by the issues and also fully informing that public about why some choices may have to be made. Um, and the third aspect here is good governance, which is addressing the ability for our governing systems as they are right now to protect the people that need protections that actually help them. Um, for instance, are there ways to compensate for economic losses in tourism or other jobs uh, for losses in the sense of place narratives that people have spent generations to cultivate? Um, it's a good chance to start looking at communities uh, for alternate solutions. So this looks like a really overwhelming talk and it's a lot to work on, but we simply cannot ignore it because RE is still up and coming and has been projected to meet the needs that the world has as far as energy goes and may even outdo the capabilities of oil and gas at some point. That being said, what are the next steps? Right, so like Yasmin said, what does all this mean? We like gave you all this information on how researchers are looking into the transition, but how can companies and governments put them into practice? So first, it's important to understand that many different factors need to be considered for each individual community, as each community values different factors when the threat of change, uh, such as the form of renewable energy, energy transition presents itself. So not all populations and communities are homogenous. One practice for one community may not work for another. Next, we need to close the gap between the public and renewable energy developers. The, the relationship between the public and RE developers seems to be heavily divided no matter what the context of opposition. If the public were more comfortable with working with familiar wind energy developers instead of faceless corpor corporations, there would be less opposition and a possibility for a compromise amongst all groups. Other, oftentimes, developers make decisions prior to consulting the public, uh, usually via forums, which makes their intentions unknown and highly suspicious. So transparency is the key to an, uh, a successful negotiation and comfort across all groups involved. Lastly, uh, we need to do research in ar areas with marginalized communities and address all of their concerns, no matter how big or small. Marginalized communities are often left in the dust, and the only way we can achieve, achieve a cohesive and ethical transition is to include all communities and address all of their concerns. So we're going to quickly look at an example of all of these kind of put into practice, and that's renewable energy in Indigenous communities in Canada. So the community and government has found that reconciliation, which is the coexistence between indigenous and settler people, um, can go hand in hand with uh, combating climate change. And although uh, renewable energy is not inherently positive in the eyes of indigenous people, the transition can seen as a pathway to reconciliation and for them to take back their lands. 
Um, so um, it's just another way for them to take back their land and have control of something that was once theirs. Um, and so we have to consider the fact that a 100% transition, which we hope for in the future, um, of renew to renewable energy um, requires indigenous people's leadership. Um, so like a quick stat of that is um, out of the 194 projects in Canada, over 25% are controlled by indigenous communities. And by control, I mean either 50% or more of those projects are completely handled by um, indigenous communities in those neighboring areas. Um, finally, here are some resources that you can look into if you're interested in joining the movement to combat climate change and fight for energy justice. Um, we highly recommend donating or even volunteering for these grassroots or organizations because they are the heart of this movement and the best way to get involved is to educate yourself and learn more about their mission. So we put a few of them up on the screen. You can like take a picture and go back and refer to their websites. You can donate, see if they have any rallies or projects in your area. Um, and if you need to go back to it, it's going to be uploaded. But these are just a few that we picked out. And that's all we have for you today. We thank you all for coming out and taking time to listen to us. Um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, all right, great. Thank you so much, Yasmin and Nikki. That was uh, wonderful. Uh, definitely learned a lot. I hear a lot about you know, renewable energy and how we need to transition to renewable energy, but I don't often hear a lot of conversations around the ethics behind it. So I just you know, wanna thank you for kind of you know, opening my eyes up to that, um, to that idea. And um, I think it's just a really important part of the conversation. Um, so I think like the, the word that kind of came to mind for me was um, you know, not just, we have to focus on renewables, we need to go, go, we need to get renewables, but we need to do it in a thoughtful way. So kind of like a thoughtful transition. And you provided us some examples, um, you know, from Canada um, that look like, or, you know, really great examples. I'm curious, did you see anything in your research, um, anything happening currently in the United States that is, you know, kind of thinking about how to, how to do this more ethically? I mean, I personally actually didn't really see anything in the US, which was really disappointing. Um, but hopefully in the future, we will move forward um, towards like a more ethical transition. We obviously still have a lot of work to do in a lot of different sectors in our country. Um, maybe this isn't the highest priority, but hopefully we'll move forward with that um, eventually. Yeah, Yasmin, I think you're muted. Yeah, I, mean, I think you're muted. Gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have a full answer, um, but I do remember coming across a resource that said there are a lot of jobs coming up in the Midwest, but I don't know the specifics of the project. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, yeah, thinking about jobs and th you know, I think that was another point that y'all were, were talking about the economics behind the renewable energy industry. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, you know, job opportunities? Um, I think that the biggest thing that we're looking at is that, especially I think with the coal mining industry, there's a lot of opposition coming from that. And even though that's dying out quite a bit, they're still saying, okay, well, where do we go from here? Um, and there are still places for those people to transfer their skills over um, as far as putting in solar panels, constructing um, the wind turbines, uh, working on maintenance and that sort of stuff. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Nikki? No, I think you said it very well. <laughs> yeah. All right, great, thanks. Um, so another thing that really kind of stood out to me, like a word in particular that stood out to me was uh, overrepresented. That was something that I think uh, Yasmin, you had said, overrepresented. You know, we often hear about needing representation on committees, um, but you know, what does that actually look like? And when you think about how, you know, on a lot of committees, there's, you know, a lot of white people are on committees and they're typically overrepresented. Um, so your idea of we need overrepresentation of people of color if we want to actually have some, you know, real actual change, um, that really stuck with me. I was, you know, just wondering if, you know, you could talk a little bit more about that and, you know, why you think that that's important. 
Do you want to go first, Nikki? No, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess if I were to phrase it, we, you don't want what it, what is the word when you have um like one person to represent uh, a group of people in, for instance, like a cast uh, of, a, of a show. Do you, do you know the word that I'm thinking of? No, um, no I can't help you out. Okay. You thinking like a token? Like a a token character. character, yes, that's exactly it, yeah. yeah. So it's not fair for the entire community to have a token character, um, in a, especially in, in a decision-making board, because one person is not going to encompass all of the spectrum of opinions that a community might have. Um, and also just because somebody is on a decision-making board is in a position of power does not mean that they still have the same amount of power as everybody else on that decision-making board because there are still sociological and psychological things that are going on maybe behind the scenes um, of that board that still come into play from their cultural backgrounds as well as in the professional background. Um, and that's why I think at least having 50-50 of a certain minority, like perhaps a minority of question and whoever else, I don't want to say white people because that's not how this is played. It's not really like white people versus everybody. And also that's not the only form of authority that can be played out here. Um, but I think at least like a 50-50 measure is a good way to maybe mitigate some of these concerns. Yeah, and I think that, you know, kind of also like the, the point you're making there, it just, uh, it, it makes me think that if we really value this, you know, if we actually value making these changes and doing things ethically and doing things in a just way, then over-representation seems like a way that we would show that we really do value this. You know, it's hard to get decisions made that would, go, you know, go and, and, and they would favor, um, you know, groups that have been marginalized, you know, if they only have that one singular voice on a committee, you know, I guess that's not enough. Um, I think that's what we really want to see. Um, so we're getting a lot of people, uh, you know, giving a lot of great, uh, great job. Everyone um, was, you know, complimenting y'all in the chat. So thank you for, for that. And then I'll just ask one final question, you know, what's kind of surprised you most when doing this research or, you know, was there anything else that you thought, you know, that you learned about that you want to maybe talk more about? Do you want to go first, Nikki? <laughs> Um, I guess um, I actually did uh, some research on this uh, last fall. So I kind of got the opportunity to kind of dive into like specifically only with wind energy. And like personally, I was shocked by how um, not we don't frequently consider ethics. And I guess especially as an engineer, that's not a priority, um, which is really disappointing. So I was excited to be able to do research on this and kind of dive into um, what exactly does it mean to consider um, the ethics of implementing these technologies because you know as an engineer I only look at like the technological aspect of it um, so I guess it was just really interesting to see how a lot of things that you don't think about goes into play especially um, like what I was talking about with the aesthetics of like how it looks like and we see it a lot in like newscasts about how people are complaining that like um the sound of wind turbines are like bothering them and that's like a legitimate concern um and you know i mean i personally don't find it like very annoying like sound wise but i guess some people do and it does affect the construction of these sites but um i guess something else i would have liked to talk a little bit more about in this presentation was um the local environmental concerns versus global. So like, what do we put like um, 
as a priority, like local, how people locally are concerned about their environments or um, endangered species in that area? Or do we put, you know, the world as a whole first because climate change is a pretty big priority, but a lot of people um, tend to argue that uh, if you're going to consider climate change, like, you know, might as well consider disrupting like uh, endangered species or habitats, um, because I found that a lot in, uh, in Scotland, there was a case, the Isle of Lewis. Um, if you're interested, you should look that up. It was really interesting because people brought up the case of like, like global, like environmental concern versus local. So I guess that was something else I, I would have wished I had more time to talk about, but um, it's really interesting to learn about. Yeah, um, and I think that perspective came up for me as well, like how can we convince people to get on board with this? Um, because I mean, it's really easy to say, guys, um, the weather's weird now. It should not be hot when it's been hot lately. It shouldn't be this cold when it's been cold lately, climate change. And it's really easy to pitch that to people, but then they say like, oh, but it's so expensive. It's so much money. Uh, and the money we put in so far, we're not seeing it go anywhere. And I really wish that I um, had the chance to do a little bit more reading on more of the economic breakdown um, and how like these projects are run and disseminated, um, just so I could explain it a little better. <laughs> All right, great. Well, uh, thank you both so much. Um, that was, uh, again, a wonderful job with your presentation. Um, I definitely learned a lot. I hope everyone else did as well. And, uh, you know, tomorrow, we hope that you will join us tomorrow at 11 a.m. We're really excited. We have a keynote speaker, uh, Shelby Orm. Uh, she's a former uh, intern in the Office of Sustainability. And now she uh, currently, um, you know, she's an activist. She's an educator. Uh, she uh, has a really large presence on social media, on YouTube and on Instagram. Uh, she'll be given a keynote about how you as an individual can really help, um, you know, create change. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you know, Nikki just kind of shared this idea that we need to have local change, global change. You know, we need to have institutional change at Texas A&M University, but also individuals have a really big role to play as well. Um, so, you know, let's con continue this conversation tomorrow and we hope to see you there at 11. And uh, again, uh, everyone have a wonderful rest of your evening and uh, ladies, thanks for um, your, your hard work and for putting this together. Um, everyone, please uh, take care.